Hi, this is the uh, third lecture that I'm going to be recording now. You should be getting this on Sunday evening. The name of this series, as you know by now, is Jews and Lithuanians, Glory, Horror, and Revisionist History. Today is the third lecture, which is entitled Chassidim Bisnagdim Maskilim Lithuania under the Tsars. Uh, we do these lectures with our sponsors. Today's Third lecture is being sponsored, first of all, by Steve Kaplan, as you see in honor of his parents, Howard and Marsha Kaplan. I would only say that one of the victims so far, casualties of the corona era, which is forcing me to do this in my home, is that Steve and I were uh, halfway through finishing the Tosefta on Nikvos. We finished the Mishnai's Tosefta. It's very difficult to go through. At least we find it that way. And we get together every Wednesday night. And I'm hoping this corona business will go away so we can actually finish it and have a seam. So thanks to Steve Kaplan. And also, this lecture is being sponsored by the Saxes, Bill and Ellen Sachs. As you can see, memory of their folks, which is very appropriate. And as it says, memory of fathers, Marvin Diamond, Mayor Ben Ephraim Alevi, and Jacob Sachs, Jacob and Moshe Shmuel, two men who loved their families and lived Jewish lives back when it wasn't so popular. I know what that means. And as you see over here, uh, Bill's father is a Holocaust survivor. Survived the Holocaust, lost a wife, daughter, most of the family. That's not unfamiliar in my family either. And so, uh, speaking about Eastern Europe and all this, I think that will go to the ancestry of Bill and Ellen and so many others. So, we thank our sponsor. Without any further ado, let's get down to business. As always, there's a lot to cover. As I said, today we're talking about carrying the story, story forward basically into the 19th century, 1800s, basically. It's entitled Hasidim, uh, Misnagdim, Maskilim, Lithuanian under the Tsars. But first to set the general uh, background. The old uh, kingdom, the Zespolitov, remember? The Republic of Nobles of Lithuania and Poland, underwent radical negative changes in the last part of the 18th century, starting very famously with our first slide here in 1772. As you can see in front of you, this is on the left-hand side is what Poland used to look like. And then Poland disappeared, meaning because it had no army, so the three neighbors just occupied and took it over. So by the time it's over, as you can see on the map on the right side, everything towards the right side of that map, Russia gobbled up. Everything toward the left side of the map, Prussia and Austria gobbled up. So by the time you finish this, it probably happened in three stages. 1772, 1793, and 1795. But by the time they finished, Poland disappeared. I mean, the country was, you know, physically the country was there, but it no longer was an independent kingdom or an independent country. Instead, it was part of somebody else's empire. Which means the Poles were so stupid as they came to see themselves that they blew it and lost their entire Matthias. As you can see in the um, next uh, slide, uh, if you look closely, you can see that the part we're concerned about, Lithuania, that's on the right side of the map. I think you can tell that by now. Almost all of it was taken over by Russia. Maybe all of it. I'm talking about the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. So the different colors simply represent, I'm talking about the right side of the map, the different colors represent what Russia swallowed up in 1772, and then in 1793, and then in 1795. So by the time it's finished, the area that you and I used to call the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which we call today Lithuania, Belarus, and Ukraine, was taken over almost totally by Russia. Now, that means that the largest Jewish community is now going to find itself, for the next 150 years approximately, it's a long time, under Russia. This was obviously a violent change for the Poles and the Lithuanians. These fiercely independent and proud national groups the Poles have built up such a Tsar. Ah, the Lithuanians since the Middle Ages have built up such an empire. Suddenly found themselves pretty doggone subservient and pitiful. How could they screw up so badly? That's what they said. Yesterday, we were a great kingdom. To compare the glorious past with the shameful present, because their own idiocy had brought about. The magnates prevented the establishment of a strong central government, and therefore Poland had no army to defend itself. To contemplate this was so painful that it produced all kind of traumas in Polish culture down until today. 
uh, so great, and then we miss it. How can we, how can we do that? This is epitomized. You know, I always like to find a movie. I'm always fascinated with the movies from the point of view of the um, of what it tells you about culture. And the most famous piece of Polish literature that I'll be talking about today a little bit later also, uh, in this movie I showed a couple years ago, uh, the most famous uh, Polish uh, piece of literature is Pan Tadius, <coughs> the story of Pan the Stir, like Sir Thaddeus, uh, which is so well known in Poles like Shakespeare, from Mitzkiewicz. And they made a big, lavish movie about this in Poland. And indeed, at the end, it's a brilliant piece of cinematography, in my opinion. You see that, uh, you'll see in a second, uh, a piece in which the Polish nobles are dancing, the Polish dance, the Polonaise, the Berserk, or whatever it is, and everything's great. And then the, sh the scene shifts cinematographically, in terms of cinematography, to the fact, no, they're just thinking about it as old memory. That's just a bunch of Polish emigres, these people who had lived so great, they had to run away from Russia, living in France, their lives of beggars, and they're looking back to the glorious past and comparing with the shameful present and what a terrible tragedy this is. And the poet says, oh, my Lithuania, I'll never get over you. Not that you know Polish to understand it, but I'll be adverting on that a little bit later also. So just take a look at this for a moment. Here's the bitter exiles in Paris. Litwo, ojczyzno moja, ty jesteś jak zdrowie. Ile Cię trzeba cenić, ten tylko się dowie, kto Cię stracił. Dziś piękność Twą w całej ozdobie widzę i opisuję. O tęsknie po Tobie. These are such famous lines I'll talk about in a minute. But it represents, you know, the, 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 the trauma. The, how, how could we have gone so bad? Now, by the way, this is not foreign to the Jewish experience. I'm doing this series during the three weeks. Now it's coming up to Shavu. We do the same thing. We say everything was so great, right? And then what happened over here? We do it on Yom Kippur when we talk about Oi, Mari Cohen, and all the rest of it. And the Mishma, Ozen, Dov, and Avshenu. That's exactly the way the Poles looked at it. To make matters worse, um, Napoleon came along a few years later, and uh, he was reorganizing Europe. And although Napoleon, as a Frenchman, seemed to be committed to restoring Poland, because that's a traditional French policy, Napoleon cynically did not do that, even though the po excuse me the Poles fought in his armies for him. What you see in front of you is you see the Poles who enlisted in Napoleon's armies and fought very bravely for him, and they did so with the hope that as a matter of gratitude he would restore Poland, and uh, didn't exactly happen that way, because what Napoleon did, as we see in the next slide, was to set up a simply a a, a mini. Polish puppet state under a Saxon prince. Those two dumb kings that I showed you last time, Augustus I, Augustus II, to their son or grandson, who is now made Grand Duke of Warsaw. No, Napoleon just invented that. What you see in front of you in the light colored area is what was called the Grand Duchy of Warsaw. No, it's a small chalik of what used to be the big area of Poland. Uh, it's the heartland of Poland. And it did not include much of Lithuania. This is important for our story. So take a look at this map, and you'll see this in the next map in a minute. If you look in the middle of it, you see a big chunk of what used to be Poland. And then as you go to the upper, I guess, right-hand side, see how the map goes upwards a little bit, the, the borders? That area above it, that's the Lithuania, what you see Mariupol and Lomża that you've heard of and Augustov. That's the Lithuanian part. But most of Lithuania was not part of that, okay? And the reason is simple. Um, Lithuania was part of the Russian Empire, and Napoleon at that particular point did not want to mess with the Russians. Okay? Now, eventually, Napoleon did mess with the Russians. Now, the, the Poles were disappointed. They said, 
we thought you would restore the old empire and Poland, Lithuania, all that. Napoleon said, manana, manana, maybe, maybe, you know. The Poles even send the girl to seduce him to do that, you know. But in, in, in 1812, I think, as we all know, uh, Napoleon got into a tangle with Russia and invaded Russia, okay? Which is very famous and described in the literature, the Russian literature, and even the world literature, as a great patriotic Russian defense war. We've all heard these stories. I thought, war and peace, the Russians fought back, they burned Moscow. Uh, look what great liars the Russians are, what piece of mis disinformation. I'll tell you what I mean. I'll tell you what I mean. Was this an invasion of Russia? In actual fact, Napoleon mostly moved through non-Russian territory. In other words, when Napoleon invaded Russia in 1812, he started like in Lithuania, as you can see in the map in front of you, and headed north towards Moscow. And so most of the area he crossed through was area that Russia had just taken over and was ruling against the will of the people. So famously, for example, Napoleon kind of began his uh, campaign by coming into Vilna. It's a very famous story. When Napoleon came into Vilna, at the head of his troops, he saw so many Jews, because he wasn't used to his huge Jewish population. And he famously said to his officers, we made a wrong turn. We're heading to Moscow. We made a wrong turn, and we, instead we conquered Jerusalem. You know what I'm saying? That was because of such, such a large group of, of frummies. So, um, as we know, if you read War and Peace, the Russians burned Moscow and kept retreating, retreating. And it was always winter. And eventually Napoleon's army had to retreat and was wiped out by the winter. That's the famous story of the War of 1812. The Russians, like Tolstoy, portray this as a victory for Russian patriotism. But really, it was a victory for Russian imperialism. Okay? Because the Russians had imposed their rule on Lithuania and Poland. I'm talking about Belarus, Ukraine, Lithuania, Latvia, where the people didn't want. So basically, when the Russians defeated Napoleon, they said, good, this allows us to keep our dictatorial control of the subject peoples of the former kingdom of Lithuania and Poland. Indeed, the campaign of 1812 justified Russian imperialism, because the Russians could say and did say, down until today, see, it's a good thing we conquered all this extra territory, like Poland, because that gave us a buffer zone. Napoleon had to spend months marching through you know, Lithuania, Belarus, and all, until he finally got to Russia proper, and by the time he got to Russia proper, crossing through all that, like it was the end of the summer, the winter was on, and if Napoleon, if we hadn't done that, Napoleon would have been able to have a jump start closer to Moscow, and he would have beaten us. You understand? So, this has always been used to uh, justify by the Russians. In fact, they took <coughs> over other territory as a, uh, as a buffer. But most of the marching was through Belarus. In fact, the, the famous Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Valtania, uh, died during the Napoleon invasion in 1812 when he was running away from the French army. From the French army, I'll say it again. Um, anyway, be that as it may, when Napoleon was defeated, and Europe was reconstituted what they call the Congress of Vienna, Russia was in a strong position, exactly like Stalin was at Yalta. And although Europe was reluctant to acquiesce in the rape of Poland, that's mamish what it was. They said, you know, Poland used to be a country, and then the Russians just took it over. And Russia said, the Tsar Russia said, I want to keep Poland. And people said, it's not fair, but in the end, Europe did acquiesce, okay? And, uh, what they did was, they said, well, let's go to the next one. We'll set up what's called the Congress Kingdom Poland, which I spoke about a year or two ago. The area you see on, on, towards the uh, center here called Zarata de Polonia, the Congress Poland. Uh, what they basically said was like this. Um, Poland deserves to continue to exist in some form. So we, the Congress of Vienna, will establish a fig leaf. This area will be called the Kingdom of Poland, but the Tsar of Russia will be the king. And the idea is it'll be under Russia, but it'll be able to keep Polish language and Polish culture. And that way there'll be like a, a share of plate of Polishness left. And that's good enough. So the Poles didn't want it, but they were stuck. Once again, as you look at the map in front of you, you see winding north, that like finger, and the upper uh, right hand as to the Lithuania. And so the Congress Poland 
was basically central Poland, it was Warsaw in the middle, and with a finger sticking up into, uh, into the Lithuania, uh, the parts of Lithuania, Belarus. But everywhere else, what you see in this map as a, called Imperial Russo, was, on, was not. From 1850 to it was on direct control of Russia. So there they don't have to play any games and pretend like they're not trying to convert it by the Russian this. In the Polish part, the Russians have to play a game. And the other part, which is Lithuania proper, what you and I today call Lithuania, Belarus, and, and, and Ukraine, the Tsar of Russia ruled there as an unchecked dictator. Now here's the thing. Although Poland, the concept of Poland, aroused sympathy and world opinion all throughout the 19th century, because all oh, poor Poland, the rape of Poland, it's not fair, it's not the other. Every once in a while the Poles rebelled and Europe sympathized with them. People heard about Chopin and all that. Nobody heard about Lithuania. <laughs> it didn't exist. You ask European, what's Poland? Oh, I know Poland. So bad what they did to them and so on and so forth. Lithuania, Lithuania what's that? You know, what's that? No one heard of it. To Westerners, Lithuania is some small area in the west of Russia. And um, even though the people aren't Russian, we don't make another world war. And so as you see in the next slide, it's called the Metternich system, which the Austrian statesman Metternich set up. And he basically said like this, if you're going to start messing with all the people that Russia's controlled, we'll have another war. I'd rather have European peace. So the heck with the Lithuanians, the heck with the uh, Ukrainians, the Belarusians, and the other Russians and Prussians and Russians, the Estonians and the Finns, and the Latvians, and who knows what else. We got no time to worry about that. It's better overall that there should be world peace. This is exactly what you and I lived through with the Soviet Union. When World War II was over, even though World War II was supposed to be a war for freedom of Europe, the Misa, FDR, and Churchill, and afterwards, we all agreed we're not going to war with the USSR nor to liberate Lithuania. Look, we're not going to war with the USSR to liberate the Ukraine. It's a bummer, you know? I feel bad for the people. It's the price of doing business in the international scene. Now, um, therefore, if you lived in the Lithuanian territories that I keep referring to, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, if you're Jewish or anybody living in Lithuania, Belarus, or Ukraine, Western Ukraine, during the 1800s, you lived in an incredibly complicated environment. The peasants uh, had not been Polonized. The peasants spoke Lithuanian and Belarusian, but of course they spoke it ungrammatically. The nobility and the upper classes, the Lithuanian nobility, the, U the Ukrainian nobility, the um, Belarusian nobility, the upper classes, they spoke Polish and regarded themselves mentally as Polish, even though they knew they had Lithuanian blood. So it's very confusing from the cultural perspective. The epitome of this there's that poem I just showed you before, that little movie, Pantadius, the most famous example of uh, Polish literature. Literally, the most famous thing. You've got to learn this in public school in Poland, you know, memorize it. This poem, in which, it's in Polish language, it's all about Polish, it's by Adam Mickiewicz, let's go to the next one, who's like the Shakespeare of Poland, and um, this Mr. Polish, Mr. Polish, the most powerful Polish literature. He's a Novartiker, he's born in Novartik, which means he's born in Belarus, and he's actually, by, by ancestry, Lithuanian, and he speaks in Polish, lyrically, about Lithuania as part of Poland. That little piece that you didn't recognize before, you know, uh, he's saying in the movie at the end, is like so famous. It's like, you know, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Let's go to the next one. Look at this. You skip the Polish part. What is he saying? Oh, Lithuania, my homeland, you're like health. Only he can truly appreciate your words. Was lost thing. Now I sing thy beauty and all thy glory. It's like you know, Levi. That's a very Jewish. Very Jewish. Oh, it's seeing hello, Sishala, Lishlama, Sarat. That's how he talks. Wait a minute. He's speaking about Lithuania in the Polish language as part of Poland. So that's weird. You understand? Um, it's highly anomalous. And uh, till this day, each of the three competing nationalisms in Eastern Europe claims him. So if you go to Minsk, you'll see a big statue of Mitskiewicz as a Belarusian. If you go to Lithuania, you'll see a big statue of Mitskiewicz as a Lithuanian. If you go to Poland, they'll, they'll definitely call him the National Shakespeare. And by the way, he was 
the, like the only or the only important Polish author who is friends with friendly to the Jews. There's a lot of anti-Semitism in Polish culture. It's a rare, rare case of philo-Semitism. But anyway, um, all I'm trying to show you is the national feelings all screwed up, and and they had to work themselves out in the course of the 19th century under the harsh control, uh, uh, regime of the czars. Now um, that means that. Uh, all these people have one thing in common. For one century, from 1815, 1915, they're in the harsh rule of Russia. What an end to the old glorious Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth as they saw it. Now, before I depart this subject to talk about the Jews, I want to make one important observation, which will be again next time. As a result of the events I just described, the two territories of Poland and Lithuania divorced over the course of the 1800s meaning their self-consciousness developed along two different lines. Each went its own way. The Poles and Congress Poland, talking about Poland, 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 and the Lithuanians, who were not part of Congress Poland, part of the Russian Empire, they will develop their own distinct national consciousness. Okay? Uh, mentally and culturally, the Lithuanians would develop slowly and surely a consciousness as a distinct national group that had nothing to do with Poland, whose connection with Poland and the Zespospolita had been a big mistake. That becomes a basic feature of Lithuanian self-consciousness. It didn't develop to the advantage of the Lithuanian half. Notice, we didn't Lithuanianize them, they Polonized us. And from now on, they said, Mikano Habo, Lithuania will go its own way, not as any part of Poland. There's a key element of the evolving 19th century Lithuanian nationalism that nobody knew about unless you were a Lithuanian Gentile. The Jews, the living Lithuanian, still considered like, you know, part of the Polish uh, culture. The very names that we um, use, we Jews use, are the Polish names. We don't call Vilnius, we call Vilna, for example. We don't call Kaunas, we call Kovna. And, uh, you know, uh, and all these different names are like that. So, because the Jews were still like, mentally holding by the old republic, by the Zespospolito. Now, in the first half of the 20th century, the Poles would think along very different lines. Not that the Lithuanians are a distinct group. And the Poles would seek to restore the old union. And this would lead to terrible relations with the Poles and Lithuanians. Now, so let's go to the next one. This is coming up. Joseph Pulsowski, who was, became the, the leader of Poland, who defeated the Soviet army, the most important Polish leader, is actually from Vilna. He's actually a Lithuanian by ancestry, but Polish by culture, with a Polish consciousness. And, you know, although it's not what he intended to, by seizing Vilna, which we'll talk about next time, and oh, taking it from the Lithuanians, he totally and radically alienated Lithuanians. And therefore, there was like a war in the 1920s and 30s between the two sides who hit each other. The Lithuanians never got over this. And the only people who benefited were... The enemies of both was Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia, because they played one off against the other. This is why nowadays, in 2020, the two countries, Lithuania and Poland, get along. They make their business get along. What happened in the past happened in the past. If we fight, it's only going to help Putin. You understand? Why should we hurt ourselves? He'll gobble us up both up. So let's try to have good relations. Now, specifically to the Jews. If there were wrenching changes, as I just described in a very broad and brief way, for the uh, non-Jewish population, in the life of the Gentiles, there were also wrenching changes in Jewish life in this, the world's largest Jewish community by far. And that's what ca characterizes the 19th century. First, let's talk about the external changes. It's no longer ruled by the Poles, it's ruled by the Tsars. The Tsars sought to replace control the population by the magnates and the gentry. We don't want them anymore. And instead, replace them with the rule of Russian bureaucrats. So if you're Jewish, and let's say, for example, your ancestors live in Lithuania or Belarus, someplace like that, the people in charge are no longer the local lord, you know, the local uh, magnate or you know, shlachta Polish uh, guy, but some Russian guy, right, who's a bureaucrat. Now, as we've seen in these talks I'm giving, from the Jewish perspective, the old system of the Polish nobles had been more human. It was possible to establish 
the relationship with them. Sometimes better, sometimes worse, but usually better. Just off the top of my head, 19th century sees the rise of the Velozhin Yeshiva. From Chaim Velozhin, we'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, everybody's Irvin. Uh, Chaim Velozhin lived in uh, Belarus. That's where Velozhin is. I, I was there. Um, the land was owned by some Polish nobleman. And Chaim Velozhin was a businessman, among other things. Uh, he did deals, business deals, in the old way, with the local Polish guy who owned all the land. The Velozhin Yeshiva was founded when the Polish guy, who was a very good friend of this rabbi, gave him a piece of land and said, here you can build your yeshiva. Might be my guest. And he, according to the stories, was a tremendous admirer of Chaim Velozhin. When Reb Chaim died, the nobleman came to the funeral and kissed his feet of the corpse, which is a sign in that culture that, of great respect. They say he had a a portrait of Reb Chaim Belezhner painted on his um, china, you know, which would used to be the style once upon a time, on his cups. In other words, you could have these kind of relationships develop because it's part of the old system. Not under the Russians, okay? The Russian uh, bureaucrats were trained, I repeat, trained professionally to be anti-Semitic. It's not a witticism on my part. It's a fact. Because the czarist state and culture had always been this way. Um, let's go to the next one. You have to understand. <coughs> Poland is Poland, and Russia is Russia. The kingdom of Poland and Lithuania in the old days went one way. The czarist state of Russia, Moscow, went another way. The Polish state was like Catholic. The czarist state was like a Russian Orthodox. There were a bunch of differences between the two. One of the big differences was as follows. The Jews were allowed into Poland and Lithuania. Jews were never allowed, ever, into Russia. If you go into Russia, you get killed. Uh, Ivan the Terrible was pressured to, uh, what you see on the right, you know, to let Jewish merchants in to help the economy. He said, no way. On the left, you see Peter the Great, who uh, is supposed to modernize Russia. And they said to him, you know, if you want a modern economy, bring in the Jews. He said, no way. In the middle is his daughter, Empress Elizabeth, the one for Catherine the Great, who said, I'd rather be thrown naked uh, in the snow to the wolves than have a Shabbat Pruta of Hana from the enemies of God, meaning from the, the Jews who killed Christ. So, you see, um, this just intense anti-Jewish feeling that expressed itself in state policy in a way that never happened in the kingdom of Poland and Lithuania. Okay? And now these guys, these son of guns, have taken over and they rule everything. Now, from the point of view of the Tsarist state and the Tsarist established, we call what I always call bureaucratic absolute state. I've discussed this in the past. Very briefly, the Tsar is the ruler and he's a dictator, meaning there's no limitations on his rule. He can do whatever he wants. But having said that, once you rule a big place, you want to do it in an organized fashion, just for, for rational reasons. And so you run the country through bureaucrats. There's no elections. Everything's top-down. So the Tsar points everybody, including the dog catcher, and in a village. So the country's ruled by the bureaucrats, and they're supposed to implement the designs, the policies of the top guys, the Tsar and his ministers. From the point of view of the Tsar's bureaucratic absolute state, all these non-Russian nationalities that inhabited the former Shashpas Politov, the Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians, the Germans, the Jews, the Poles, Ukrainians, the Belarusians, and I don't know who else. All these people were not viewed as minorities to be won over by benevolent administration. That ain't the Russian style. Rather, they were viewed by the Russian government and the bureaucrats as existential problems that can only be solved in one way, by Russification, by converting them to us. Listen, they're not black, they're not yellow. They don't stand on the population, they look like everybody else. So if you play your cards right, You'll change their consciousness, like I spoke to you before. The Poles changed the consciousness of the upper class of Lithuanians. The Russians wanted to change the consciousness of everybody and make them feel Russian. And then they'll be Mamela, part of the Russian people, and the, and the problem will be solved. Because we'll, only have, we'll have a country with no minorities. Everybody's Russian, you see? That's the way they, in order to make life easier and more secure from the perspective of Moscow, of St. Petersburg, everybody's culture was to be elided. So for the Poles and Lithuanians, it meant that under Russia, 
there's a policy of erasing their language, erasing their literature, their culture, and hopefully their religion. <clears throat> Again, a whole switch from Catholic eventually to Russian Orthodox. And in other words, make them exactly like the Russians. And that's the goal of the policy. And to be frank, that's what the goal of the policy was towards the Jews in these territories. Here we have in the next slide uh, the notorious Nicholas I, the Tsar of Russia from 30 years, who was called the Russian Haman, um, accurately so. And in his policies, and I've discussed this in other times, he went after exactly the things that make the Jews be different than others. No, the goal of his policy was precisely what I said, to convert the Jews to Russian and Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, switch them. And if you can't do it overnight, you, you, you push them in that direction, hopefully eventually you get done. This, for example, is why he forced, by, by police force, the Jews to change their dress. I don't want to look either. I want to look like the Russians. Take a look at the next picture. That's Chavetz Khan. That's a famous uh, video that everybody's seen lately. I'll show you in a second. That's a real picture of Chavetz Khan in 1923. He ain't wearing a strimal. <laughs> He's not wearing a spotik. He's wearing what they call a Russian hat. Um, why? Because he lived in the 1800s. He's actually born under Nicholas I. And uh, the Jews were forced to switch their, their clothing. Right? Even so, they endeavored the best they could you know, to look Jewish, which they did. But they had to change their clothing. I'm talking now in the Russia proper, in La Russia and Lithuania. Take a look at the next. Uh, I assume you've seen this, or maybe you have it. Here's the Chavitz Chaim, the only uh, video of him, um, attending the Agoda Convention in, in, in Vienna in 1923. But that's the clothing. Now, the Tsar and the regime under Nicholas I made a campaign to stamp out Shabbos candles, shetels, they went on the street. If you're wearing the shetel, they tore it off. And you let you walk around um, bold. Because the Jewish women in Russia used to like the satra. It's to save everything. People don't know that. It was to force them. This is where it comes that the women don't cover their hair in Lithuania. Because the czars were the regimes. Uh, get rid of payas. Anybody, we don't like the Nicholas doesn't like the payas. So we saw you walk on the street with payas. Uh, the police would cut it with a scissors, a big scissors that he gave out to all the cops. And they usually took part of your ear off. And so the Jews stopped wearing pays. Um, uh, kosher food, extra taxes on the kosher food to get you to stop keeping kosher. And particularly, uh, and remember he did the Cantonists where they kidnapped the kids. Um, they, um, excuse me. They drafted the kids and kept them in the Russian army for 25 years. Which the idea is to convert them. And most importantly, Chinuch. He wanted to transform the um, educational system and uh, begin to indoctrinate the younger generation along the lines that I just said before, that they should eventually become Russian and Christian. Right? This is, uh, we all know this. Now, um, remember, this is not Poland. In Poland, he had to act a little bit different because there he's supposed to respect the Polish culture. But in Lithuania, in Belarus, in those places, he is a total dictator. Europe doesn't interfere. He can do whatever he wants. Okay? So the areas of what you call the Grand Duchy of Lithuania were exposed to the full rigors of the Tsarist regime. And when he dropped dead, which everybody was happy about, in 1855, during the Crimean War, his son, next slide, Alexander II, took over. had the same goal, just to use more of a, a carrot, as they say, than a stick. He liberalized a little bit with the idea that maybe the liberalization will encourage the Jews to move in the desired direction. The desired direction is out of Jewish separateness, out of Jewish distinctiveness, out of Jewish religion, hopefully. You see? And become part of Russia. All of the Tsars, down to 1917, maintained the Pale of Settlement. Now, let's go to the next one. The Pale of Settlement was a territory. Do you recognize it? I mean, that's the old uh, kingdom of uh, Poland and Lithuania. That's what it is. It's, almost all of it is the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Right? That's the maps we've been looking at. Those territories which have been annexed by the Tsars were, by law, the only places where Jews allowed to live. So in other words, if you're Jewish, you can't move to the right, to the lighter colors over there. That's Russia Mamish. So, uh, that's crazy. That means, use the American model, if uh, the Jews are only allowed to live in the Northeast. 
And they only live in uh, New England, New York, or Pennsylvania, and uh, let's say Maryland, Delaware. That's it. Jews are not allowed legally to move to Ohio or anywhere like that, and to the west. They can't move to Virginia anywhere south. They all left to live in that area. And uh, keep that in mind. Because one of the things that's going to happen in the course of the 1800s, that I'll talk about this more next time, is a gigantic baby boom. And the Jewish population will double and triple. You know what I said? It's sort of like Pharaoh, Kasher Yanus, or But that'll mean that you have a demography problem with too many people for the economy to handle. And that's why your grandparents will move to a place called America, isn't it? You get it? This is, this is where the Great Migration will come later in the century. Now, um, that means even the liberal czar, Nicholas II, um, Alexander II, still kept the essential policy, I want to keep the Jews out of Russia, in the Pale Settlement, unless they sort of assimilate or convert or something like that. Now, um, this is crazy. That means that Russia will be the one country, proudly, which goes against uh, PC. The political correctness of the 19th century is you can't persecute the Jews in Russia. We can do what we want. We can do what we want. As the 19th century progressed, more and more Jews came to see, had no choice but to see that Russification was to some degree necessary concession if you want to progress in life. Now, the Tsar system kind of worked. If you want to get a job, you want to do anything, you better learn Russian, and you better kind of Russianize yourself, you know, the way we in America are sort of Americanized. And um, the more you do it, the better it will be for you in life. Or at least that's the promise mm -hmm. that's held. And uh, the pressure of Russian culture, not Polish culture, not Lithuanian culture, but Russian dominate uh, Tsarist culture will be the big thing. The fact that most of the Rabbanim, for example, could not speak Russian, but they only spoke Yiddish, which had never been a problem in Poland, um, caused a lot of problems. So, for example, there's a big difference between Rabchaim Brisker on the left hand side, who couldn't speak Russian and didn't want to, and always had a lot of problems in his life as a result of that, versus the Archa Shulchan, who by by his upbringing, uh, could speak Russian, and always had a much easier time with the authorities as a result of that. If not for the unrelenting anti-Semitism of the Tsars and his regime, in my opinion, there would have been a big flood of Jews assimilating into Russian identity. No, the Russians didn't play their cards right. If the goal was to get the Jews to assimilate, they should have done like America, like the West, be nicer to them than a ton of Jews, because that's what happened in this country, a ton of Jews would have dropped out of Yiddishkeit and gone into Russianness. The Russian culture, very strong culture, 19th century. Tchaikovsky, Tolstoy, oh my goodness, you know, Rimsky, of course, you know, the golden age of Russian culture. There's a lot to get into there. But paradoxically, the Russians couldn't do it. To say, we liberalize and give the all the civil rights. Move wherever you want. Because the Russians actually feared that a flood of Jews would come into Russian culture and society, and then the Jews would take over because they're smarter than the Russians. This is classic 19th century uh, European anti-Semitism. We want the Jews to stop being Jewish. We want them to come in and consume our culture, but we don't want them to produce culture. And it's not possible with smart people like the Jews who have a lot of intellectuals. They want to write, they want to think, they want to express their ideas, they want to contribute. But then the Russians say, no, do you want to take over Russia? So then make up your mind. If you're afraid the Jews will come and take over Russia, leave them alone in the Pale Settlement and subsidize yeshivas and Hasidic rabbis and keep them isolated and they'll stay out of everybody's life. No, the Russians can't do that. Well, then go the other way and do whatever you can to liberalize and bring them into Russia. Well, no, we can't do that either. And so the Russian policy toward the Jews was always self-contradictory, which led to all kinds of problems eventually to the Russian Revolution, among other things. Now hold that thought. While we turn our attention to wrenching changes in Jewish life that were internal in nature. At the start, in the 1700s, as we've seen, Judaism and Jewry throughout the Jeshbas Polito, throughout all that huge territory of Poland Lithuania, have been pretty doggone monolithic. Wherever you went, it's the same Yiddish, the same Minhagen, the same Rabban, the same Siddur, the same Sepharim, the same Hashkafa, 
the same superstitions. And that was like, a, made you, if you're Jewish, you felt part of a Jewish nation living throughout this whole area, wherever you go, there's people like you. And then, as we know, things started to change. The first big change that caused splits was Hasidism, which has its origins as, I think you know, with the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov still lived all of his life in the Shesh Bosh He died in 1760. Um, no, as he lived his life, let's go to the next one. Right? The Baal Shem Tov, as you can see over here, the map in front of you shows um, Poland in the southern part and then that big chunk of Lithuania in the middle. And uh, the Baal Shem Tov actually lived his life, I guess, in the lower right-hand corner of the map. Um, we see Lvov and, to the, and, and to, the, uh, to the right of that. In Podolia and in eastern Galicia and Ukraine, basically Ukraine, which was part of the Kingdom of Poland uh, and, and Lithuania at that time. Uh, almost all the life of Baal Shem Tov was spent in the Polish part. We do know, which is just interesting, that um, the Baal Shem Tov in his day had a reputation as a, uh, uh, I guess the best word we would call today, a Baal Shem is somebody who does alternative medicine. In the case of Baal Shem, you do alternative medicine not only consisting of uh, herbs and drugs and that sort of thing, natural food I guess we call today, but you combine it with tefillos, with prayers, with brachas, with amulets and things of that nature. And so one of the things you go to a Baal Shem for, as opposed to a regular MD, is for exorcism. And we know that the Baal Shem was, uh, Baal Shem was once invited in his career to go to Shklov, which is right near Vilna, which is in the heart of Lithuania, to do an exorcism. So my point is that early Hasidism wasn't really Hasidism in the sense of a separate movement. It was just a Baal Shem Tov. During his time, Hasidism was a kind of piety, which is what Hasidus has always meant in the old days in traditional Judaism. And Eastern European Jewry certainly always had that. Let's go to the next one. In the 18th century comes out the famous book, Masil Seshar, which is written in Italy and has a big reception in uh, Eastern Europe. And the Masil Seshar goes into great detail about what Hasidus is. He's not a Hasid, as we understand the term nowadays. He has whole chapters on Hasidus and Preciouses. And uh, although it's a very wide subject, but um, basically, you know, to, to, to dumb it down to its essential elements, Hasidus and Precious simply means um, you're going <coughs> lifting me sure as I didn't. If you're a parish, then you say that even though I don't have to abstain from these things, but out of pietistic reasons, I'm going to. Like, no, this is really kosher, but I'm just a sign of my own to keep a higher standard and not eat. That would be like a parsh. And a chassid is mitzvah Even though the Torah and the halacha requires me only to do this, I want to do more. Because I love God. I want to do more. I love God. That's the classic uh, chassidus. But uh, the Baal Shem Tev, I think as we know, in the kingdom of Poland in the 1700s, introduced a kind of unique twist to the pietism. It's a huge subject, so I'll just mention one or two points. One would be involving the reject uh, the rejection of the harsh uh, penances that were part of the old uh, Hasidic old culture. You do a sin, you have to punish yourself in this with flagellation, all kind of other things like that. And I would call the obsession with sin, which the old Hasidic like cherished, the obsession with sin. And the to have more like the modern and constructive attitude. Don't concentrate on what you did wrong. Build on what you did right. Now, um, whatever it is. In his lifetime, this wasn't a divisive movement. But after the death of Baal Shantov in 1760, in the last years of the old kingdom of Poland, the Jesus Polito, and at the time of the first partition in 1772, Hasidism, as we know, did indeed turn into a distinct movement and assumed its present form that we recognize today, not simply as a group of pietists, Jews who want to go lift me sure as I did, but as an organized group of sworn followers of a Rebbe, a kind of a rabbi that never existed before. There's no such thing, really, as a chassid without a Rebbe. Somebody says, I'm a chassidic, I'm no Rebbe, that's not a chassid. You have to have some Rebbe. But the institution of Rebbe never existed before, that somebody says something and you just do it. Right? For various reasons. You, you follow, okay? Moshe Rabbeinu was not a Rebbe like that. Look at the Chumash. Moshe is always telling Jews this, that, and the other. They don't listen. 
the Rambam, the Ramon, and all the other, not rabbis, they're rabbis. Rabbi tells the people, this is what the din is, they say, you do it, we're not going to do it. We're going back to Egypt, we're doing whatever we want. The rep, this is inconceivable. Take, for example, when the Lubavitch Rebbe is alive. He told somebody, go to Antarctica. The guy immediately books a ticket to go to Antarctica. Nothing to talk about. You see? The, 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 the Rebbe said so. This kind of Simon Says thing is a new institution. And uh, it was introduced for the first time in Poland in the 18th century. Now, this lecture series is not the place to examine closely the history of Hasidus and the history of the opposition that Hasidism engendered among the regular Jews, what we call the Misnagdim, which means the opponents, Suffice it to say for our purposes today, the Hasidism provoked very strong feelings pro and very strong feelings against uh, throughout the Kingdom of Poland. These resulted in much inner strife in Polish and Lithuanian Jewry just at the time that the country was falling apart and being taken over by the Russians. Which is the, and by the way, the Kingdom of Poland Lithuania is the only place where Hasidism appeared. It didn't appear in Germany or France, anywhere like that. Overall, uh, the opposition to Hasidism, and let's look at the next map, uh, collapsed in the Ukraine. So in other words, there was long, strong feelings, but if you look at the map in front of you of the old Zhezh uh, Pospolitop, you see on the right and the left and in the middle. So on the right is uh, Ukraine, and there the Hasidim won a total triumph. Uh, everybody converted to Hasidism. Uh, an, <laughs> if somebody says it's wrong, he was like one out of a million. If you look all the way on the left, upper left, the heart of Lithuania, they're the opposite. Um, there the Misnagdim held out mostly, and uh, it was a place where Hasidim did not penetrate, except to a limited extent. In the middle was the middle. The middle is that huge area in the, in the middle, what's called Belarus. And here was 50-50. Uh, you had a very large Hasidic population, this is where Lubavitch was. Lubavitch is located in Belarus. The, the, the Alta Rebbe was in um, whatever, uh, Ladi and places like that. This is Belarus. Here, there was a very bit, bitter fight because both sides were very well represented. There was a lot of Misnagdim who rejected Hasidism in principle, violently. But the time they say, and it was true, they say that Lubavitch, the first the founder, this is before they went to Lubavitch, the founder of Chabad, 100,000 Hasidim. That's a huge number. 100,000. <laughs> And besides Chabad, you had, I don't know, Slonim and Carlin and these other groups in there. Uh, <coughs> it was flourishing, and so it was a time of great uh, tension, you might say. Right? Now, as you know, as we know in the ne as we go to the next one, uh, the result was very bitter strife. The so Vilna Gon on the left, the Alta Rebbe on the right, this is like synonymous with the Hasidim Misnagdim face. And to this day, people are arguing that this side or that side. Uh, all we can, and, and it was productive of a lot of splits and, and, and period. The long and the short of the story goes like this. The Misnagdim lost. Their attempt to excommunicate Hasidism, to stamp it out, to stigmatize it as a non-Jewish movement, like a Sabaki movement, that just didn't work. Uh, the masses said basically, Vilnagon, you're a great man, but you're just wrong with this. The Hasidic movement is not some heretical movement. It's different, but it's not heretical. But the, listen closely, but having lost, the Misnagdim did not convert to Hasidism. They remained anti-Hasidic. And so Belarus and Lithuania split into two opposing groups of Jews with a whole variety of different relations with them throughout the 19th century. Okay? So, particularly in Belarus. So sometimes, so there was a lot of places where part of the community was Hasidic, and part of it was a misnagdim. What do you do? Do you have two different rabbis? That's often was one way of solving it. You know, they have their community, their community. Do you have two, two different shechitas? You know, two different varakashas? You have two different mikvahs? Um, sometimes they're able to unite under one guy. Uh, occasionally. Sometimes not. There are always fights. Who should be the next shochet? Sometimes, if somebody married from the other side, like a misnagdim, they would, they would like, like sit shiva for them. Other times, not at all. There are plenty, plenty of people... Uh, I just did a talk the other day about Rav Kook. He come from a mixed marriage. The father was a Mesnaga, the mother was a Lubavitch. You know what I'm So, uh, there's all kinds of sets of possibilities of relations that existed in these groups throughout the 1800s. But one thing's clear, the old monolithic Judaism was gone, and this itself 
uh, weakened the fabric of Lithuanian Jewry because it used to be one thing and everybody was the same and same davening and same everything. But at the same time it kind of invigorated things because once you get religious splits there's a negative and a positive. Negative is it's, it's a split. Period. Positive is it forces each side to get their act together to be able to argue against the other. So it brings a spirit of uh, uh, dynamism and uh, this did happen. But klapichus, as far as the external world is concerned, the lack of the old monolithic unity was not good now that the Jews were faced with the threats from the Tsarist regime. The Russian Tsars could not make up their minds what they wanted to do with the Jews. They didn't think like the magnates in Poland, let the Jews flourish, do their own thing, and just take 50 or 60 percent off the top. That was the old smart the Polish way. The Russian bureaucrats feared that if the, uh, the, the despised Jews would, through their cleverness, seize total control of the Russian economy, the way it appeared that they seized total control of the Lithuanian economy, that the Russians would end up as slaves to the Jews, which profoundly offended the master race mentality of the Russians. So they considered themselves master race. After all, they started with the city of Moscow and they're like this, until they had the biggest empire in the world, running from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And so they rule others. They're not ruled by others. Like the Russians, people don't know this because we're Westerners. Just like the British have a big empire and that mentality that we're meant to rule, the Russians have the same thing. Now here's a group of the Jews, what they say, they're smarter than us. So what do we do with them exactly? And uh, I would say until today, the Russian policy is always zigzag on this subject. So the Russian bureaucrats, with their professional training in cynical manipulation of subject races, we're always thinking of how to tinker with the internal life of the Jews in such a way as to mold the Jews into the type of subservient race the Russians would like. This, of course, was impossible. It's not the Jews are. But may fit for other ethnicities and not the Jews. To the Russians, the sheer mass of the Jews, which grew and grew in Lithuania, Belarus, and Ukraine, who sometimes were the majority of the population in places. The differentness of the Jews, the proud disdain the Jews displayed towards others, which was the result of what we've been talking about in this course. Uh, the proud Jewish consciousness that I described that had developed in the good old days in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. All this was profoundly off-putting and offensive. We're the bosses. The Jews should be, you know, kissing up to us. The Jews would kiss up to them, but you could tell they just did it for, for effect. You know, the Jews was oh, bow down to you. But it's like Yaakov and Esau. You knew in their hearts they thought we're much superior to you. Which they did feel that way. And what makes things even worse from the Russian point of view is the Jews have other Jewish groups throughout Europe. And these other Jewish groups and beyond Europe were gaining power of all sorts in the 19th century. What's the story of the Jews in the 1800s? Little by little, they're getting civil rights and eventually an um, important uh, amount of power through uh, all m m kinds of ways in the West. Oh, the Russians hate this. And so at the same time the Tsar is trying to stamp out Judaism, we have the, the famous scenes in Victorian England in which Palmerson, I love this dramatization, uh, gives his famous speech saying England is ready to go to war for a Jew, Don Pacifico, because even if he's Jewish, he's a British subject and he's entitled to, to be supported by the Queen and the Parliament supports him. Take a look at this. I found this on, online. That's Lord Palmerston. Let me begin by asking, what does it mean to be a citizen of this great nation? What does it mean? To be an Englishman? Is it a question of birth, location, dress? By none of these criteria could Don Pacifico be called an Englishman. But I believe that to be a subject of Her Majesty the Queen means so much more than any of these things. British citizen, like the Roman in days of old, held himself free from indignity when he could also say, Civis Romanus so. So also the British subject 
shall feel confident that the watchful eye and strong arm of England shall protect him from injustice and wrong in whatever land he may be. The Russians couldn't understand as long as you say the Jews are controlling England. And Palmerston, who was in power for decades, was always a great friend of the Jews. And he's always busting the Russians. He stopped them a bunch of times in the Middle East. Here's a famous cartoon of yesteryear where Pam, that's Palmerston, punches Nicholas and knocks him out. It's called the Crimean War. And uh, so the Jews aren't like the Chechens or the Lithuanians. Uh, let me put it this way. There's no Lithuanian group in England or France. There's no uh, Estonian um, population in any of these countries. But it's a Jewish population. These Jews now include Rothschild and who knows what else. Eventually, Disraeli will become prime minister, as you know. And this is true elsewhere. And the Russians hate the fact, the Tsars hate the fact, that they want to do something to the Jews, it makes an outcry in the world. Because they want to have their way, have the cake and eat it. Want to be looked at as a benevolent person, but at the same time sticking it to my Jewish subjects. They can't get away with that. Uh, Palmerston sent Montefiore in 1846 to protest at Azar because Nicholas wanted to move the whole Jewish population away from the border, even though it would disrupt lives. And Nicholas had to pretend to be a gentleman, but he hated having to meet with this Jew Montefiore. You understand? And so, to the Russians and the regime, the Jews are a problem, and a big problem. What do you do with them? Now, in analyzing it, they were very smart. And they said the culprit is the Talmud. The Talmudic culture, the religious culture of Jews, is to keep them separate and feeling that they're superior and uh, not assimilable all the rest of it. You want to know something? In economy, they were correct. The Jewish culture is not biblical, it's Talmudic. And so, the Tsars tried to destroy the Talmudic culture, the Jewish culture, and therefore destroy Jewish consciousness. The way the Lithuanians, I told you before, had, had lost their consciousness. The Tsar wanted to do that with the Jews by destroying Talmudic education. But Jewish education was totally Talmudic, as we've discussed in other places. That's what the old haters and yeshivas were like. You just study Gemara. So this led the regime to team up with another element among the Jewish population that was rising at that time, a small element, rising on its own for its own reasons in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, and that's the Masculine de Haskalah, which I gave a whole series on in the past. Now, this is not the place to go into Haskalah in detail. Suffice it to say that the Haskalah movement was moving things, I would say, in Jewish culture generally to the left, and the Hasidim opposed all kinds of Haskalah from the beginning to the end. By contrast, the Misnagdim were okay with moderate Haskalah, but not with radical Haskalah. So as long as the Haskalah was um, fundamentalist, believed in the Torah and all the rest of it, the fact that you wouldn't have a broader education, you know, was it was a take it or leave it kind of thing. You know, some were into that, some were not into that. That didn't make someone trafe. But if you want to get rid of God, then the Torah, that made a trafe. Now, the Tsarist regime cynically supported the Masculine, creating a special school system for them to break the Cheder Yeshiva system. This was the policy of the next uh, slide of the famous Count Uvaro. It's very interesting. Someone just published a last year a um, biography of this guy, as you can see over there, who created conservative modern Russia. In other words, Uvar was in charge of education and he used it to indoctrinate the Russians into this uh, counter-modern uh, culture where Putin is a, is a perfect representative of, that the Western culture is decadent, the Western culture is bad, democracy is not a good idea, liberalism is not a good idea, the Russian idea is a better idea, and part of it is stick it to the Jews. But Uvar was very clever. What he said was, I'm going to convert all the, I want to uh, ban all the haters and the yeshivas and replace them with a different model. So, to use Baltimore language, I want to get rid of, t of T.I. and Beis Yaakov and replace everything with Beth Defoe and Salman Shekhar. The Jewish. Okay. And I want to get rid of the yeshivas, replace them with a rabbinical seminary, which is, uh, which was a joke. This was a big push, which means you're trying to interfere, micromanage Jewish life and create the new type of Jew and Jewish rabbi and all the rest of it who will be primarily a servant of the state and agent of the police. 
Uh, the Russians did do this to the Christian church. That's the history of Peter the Great. They want to do it to a Jewish religion. Now, um, as a result, these schools were set up. People went to them. That, you had to. The Haskalah becomes an important part of Jewish culture in the course of the 19th century in Lithuania. Especially, I would call the conservative Haskalah, the, the more traditional Haskalah, the more moderate, middle-of-the-road Haskalah. This was, many people don't know this, this, this was a basic feature of the Litvaks from now on until the show, until the Holocaust. Um, when the Holocaust came, that's the end of that. That killed the Haskalah, that killed the Litvaks. And so, that whole culture does not survive the Second World War. You and I may have remembered one or two people here in Baltimore or elsewhere from that time, but they're gone. Okay? Uh, so it was episode. But in its day, the Haskalah was, had a certain clear popularity in many circles in Lithuania and Belarus. Now remember, the Haskalah is Jewish. It writes in Hebrew. It talks about Jewish life. It is not simply the creation of this guy, Uvaro. He used what was already there. There were internal dynamics going on in Lithuania and Belarus and the Ukraine in the 19th century. And I described this in the past, so I'll just put it in bullet points. Look, there are some people interested in things beyond Gamar, Gamar, Gamar. It's not, it's not what they want. The difference, sim simplifying it is, do you want something in addition to Gamar, Gamar, Gamar? Or do you, do you want something instead of Gamar, Gamar, Gamar? If you want something in addition, so what you're basically saying is, I want to be a firm guy, I want more, more broad minded. Right? I want Tanakh, I want this, Jewish history. If you want something in place of it, they've been saying like this, the Gomorrah and all is a bunch of baloney, let's create another Jewish culture. Now, here geography plays an important role. Let's go to the map. The Lithuania and Belarus are on the border of Prussia, of Germany. If you look at the map in front of you, you see where it says Germany? In the 19th century, and you see all the way to the right hand side, like the, the finger of Germany running across the top of the Baltic. Right after that is, is, is Lithuania and Belarus. The country of Lithuania is adjacent to uh, Prussia, to, to Germany. Okay? Although Lithuania is in the east, it's never far from the west. There's always a lot of travel back and forth. Uh, a lot of Lithuanian and Belarusian Jews uh, did intercourse, they traveled merchants and things like this. They lived for long periods of time in, in East Prussia, which is what you see over there. We saw Salanter used to live among these groups in the 19th century. Uh, so European cultural influence will be pronounced in Lithuania. The educated Jews in Lithuania will know what's happening in European science and culture. You know what I'm talking about? If you live in Kovno, if you live in Panovis, if you live in Tells, places like that, even Mir, the border's not that far away. It's like it's like Baltimore and, uh, I don't know, uh, Delaware or something like that. But the, you know, it's not that far away. And so, therefore, you're not talking about another world. You're just in the Russian Empire, which is a different place. But the discovery, the new ideas, the, the uh, culture that's first thing in the West, especially in Germany, is literally next door. Okay? So don't be surprised if a lot of these ideas penetrate into Lithuania and... Uh, have a lot to do with the rise of the house call. No, a guy goes on a business trip. He comes back from Germany. He said, what did you see when you were on your business trip in Berlin? Oh, I see that there's this in the newspaper and this new idea over here. There's a guy named Darwin now, you know. There's a guy who discovered electricity. I don't know, whatever they came up with. The guy named Freud. And all of a sudden, this is being talked about at the Shabbos tables in Lithuania. Now, if that were the whole story, the presentation... I'm sorry. If, if that were the whole story, the penetration of European... Eastern and Western culture into the Jewish population of Lithuania, that was the story, and a decline and indeed a disappearance of traditional Judaism, first the disappearance of Gemar, 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 and eventually the disappearance and decline, at least, of religious observance, to me our story would not be so interesting. It would be as boring as the history of the decline and disappearance of Jewish knowledge and Jewish religious practice of much of, say, American Jewry in our time. That's boring. What makes the story in Lithuania interesting is the dissonance between the two sets of Litvaks that emerged. Those who, strong, who clung strongly to the old, especially fundamentalism, 
and those who abandoned the old for the new. The story is interesting in the latter case because it asks, what's the new? What new did they create or discover? What new forms of Judaism and Jewish culture? In the former case, the from, it asks, what new forms of traditionalism or orthodoxy were created in response to the challenges of modernity? Now first, the non from The Lithuanian Jews, who were not satisfied with the old culture, either assimilated, Tom, and became post-Jewish, plenty of people just, just dropped out of Judaism. I'm not talking about the converts. I'm not talking about that. The Jews, they just stopped being, having any connection to Judaism, like many people in America. But this first group, as is the case in America, doesn't add anything to Jewish. They just uh, opt out. But second, what I would call the Russian Haskalah, <coughs> in which many are moderate and religious, but the cutting edge elites of the Russian Haskalah embrace radical secularism, especially atheism. Atheism. In other words, even though, they'll argue, the Torah is not true as a fundamentalist document, it has value as a document of secular nationalism. And even on this there was debate. You know, we call it a Chadam versus Micha, Micha Yosef Berdachevsky. You don't have to know all that. You know, should we still keep the Jewish tradition and the Torah stuff there and use it in a secular way? Or should you turn your back on everything in the past? Shinu Erchen and embrace a radically new type of Jewish living which has nothing to do with the past. Now what emerges as popular in Lithuania, popular, was what we call cultural Zionism, which is the former. This is associated with Hanaam, who was in Lithuanian. His ideas were very popular because he was a great writer in Lithuania. Again, I mean Lithuanian, Belarus. And basically what you think over there is like, he's atheist, but he's a very strong Jew. So how do you do that? So you say, Judaism is not a religion, it's a nationality, it's a secular nationality. See, an analog of Jewish is not Christian. The analog of Jewish is French and, and, and uh, British, and then Russian. So the Jews is a national group, okay? National group has a national culture. The Jews have a national culture. Obviously, he wasn't stupid. He knew that, um, I mean, he, he actually knew how to learn. Let's put it this way. Hanan was born in the short cover Hasidic family, and he was related to the Lubavitch Rebbe. So he came from a uh, you know, very traditional background. But he evolved out of that. And he wanted to come up with the whole idea that basically we need a new and alternative Judaism, which is not based on the old ideas, because the old ideas to him are untenable. So, right off the bat, if you don't believe there's a God, then everything flows from that, correct? And talking about the Torah, the Torah, you're going to view everything in radically different ways. Now, added to this was um, the movement of Chovei Sion, which arose in the 1880s after the pogroms in Russia we talked about last year, or two years ago which eventually morphed into political Zionism. So you have now cultural Zionism, political Zionism, which I think you know was Theodor Herzl just trying to get a Jewish state. When Theodor Herzl visited Vilna in 1903, on his way to visit members of the Russian government, he had a reception, like unbelievable. All these Jews, including the Fermis, came out. Treated him almost like a Mashiach figure. The, you won't believe this, who was there? But Saul Kohn was the chief rabbi of Vilna, a giant Talmud Chacham came out and greeted him like with a Zayvur Torah, like with some king or whatever. Because in their mind, Herzl personified the idea we might actually get a Jewish state soon and get out of Russia and move to Israel as a Jewish state. Um, which means the Zionist <laughs> idea, as you and I call it today, the idea of moving back to Eretz Israel and Jews leave the Gauls, very popular. So these new ideas are percolating, particularly in Lithuania. Okay? I would say Zionism in general was very strong there because Zionism, among other things, provided a possible joint platform for the post-religious but still very Jewish types, like a Hanan, and the, what's the right word, the Maskil Torani Nehmana Masara, the type of um, Orthodox Jew, very broad-minded, and is inter So in other words, you're interested in Gemara, 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 but other things as well. And uh, they can both agree to work for Israel. Uh, in general, I would point out, it was very hard to be an anti-Zionist like the Satmar in Lithuania. 
that did not go over. Not till the end, not till the, the, the show up. Then you know how many feet talking in Lithuania hardly. That you know, you can't have a state of Israel because the Mashiach didn't come. If first you're gonna get a state of Israel, they move there. You understand? Know Obviously the Fruman wanted to be a Shamar Shabbat state. The non Frum would be a Bakal Shabbat state. That's a different story. But in principle, there's no mitzvah to live in Russia as opposed to Jerusalem, if it's possible to move to Jerusalem. In addition to these masculine, uh, even the from ones, another trend developed among the fundamentalists, one which was to have profound consequences. And I'm talking about the Lithuanian yeshivas. Viewed historically, the Lithuanian yeshivas, as you as I use these terms, and I'm thinking of Sobotka and Tells, the way Mir developed, and Panovich, and you know, all, these other, all these types of places, they all stem from the last third of the 19th century. These are institutions which not only educate in the Talmud, but they indoctrinate, or inspire, the students to fundamentalism, and especially to Gemara, 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 to be all and end all of Judaism. Now these are counter-modern ideas, but a movement of counter-modernity is itself a modern phenomenon. Do you get that? Right. Hundreds of years ago, you see it was a place where everybody learned, and that's what Jews do everywhere, those who were able to, and Gemara. Uh, now, to do that means you're rejecting the Western style. I'll use, to make this easier for you to understand, think of America today. I'm not going to college, I'm a sit and learn. There's a movement of counter-modernity, you see? Now, I'm going to be a little bit egghead here, which I strive to avoid in the lectures, but I'm just a little bit in the mood. Speaking from a historical perspective, the rise of the Lithuanian yeshiva in the 19th century stems from a number of factors. First, the energy released in the Misnagdik fights. As I said, the Misnagdim lost the fight to excommunicate the Hasidim, but the Misnagdim themselves did not convert. Living in the same country as the new dynamic Hasidism, Misnagdim were spurred to provide a dynamism of their own, and it came to be expressed in this idea of new and deep learning. And obviously in this, we go to the next slide, the patron saints would be the Vilna Gaon or Chaim Velazhner, because he started the Velazhner Yeshiva. That's what he saw as a legacy of Vilna Gaon. What's the difference? You're learning Gemara before you're learning Gemara. Now we're going to learn in a very deep way, in a very broad way. And that's going to um, introduce a new element, and, and it did. This led, of course, as I said before, to Velazhner Yeshiva. We were talking about thinking big terms, cover whole shots, have a broad perspective, you know, uh, bring in a wide ranging and wide and deep. Why indeed? Uh, not necessarily a new ideology, although the truth is, in that book in front of you, Nefesh Chaim, you sort of have a new ideology in the way it's, it's put together. It's a Kabbalistic ideology of all things. I'll say it again. The Lithuanian Yeshivas don't study Kabbalah, but the ideological justification for them is Kabbalistic, and that's found in this book, the Nefesh Chaim, from Chaim Belozhar. Okay? Now, um, uh, Yeshiva is not, the Volusian Yeshiva is not a matter of ideology. They didn't try to give the students a particular ideology. But they did provide as the Yeshiva can a very rich student life, a great job, as you know, thinking, you know. They do like like a college in the old fashioned way, by each together, you know. They, they, they did provide that life, you see, left from a lot of student memoirs. That's one dynamic. Another one that led to the rise of these Yeshivas was the angry reaction of from Jews to Nicholas and Uvarov. They're trying to stamp out the Torah, which they were. They're trying to stamp out the Yeshivas, trying to stamp out the Cheder. So we'll fight back. And we'll double down. And the Yeshiva, therefore, was seen as a place in which to resist and counter the efforts of the modern Antiochus and the modern Hellenist Jews. Because we had traitors before, and we have traitors now. And we're going to be the Maccabees. We're going to express this through living a total Jewish life and total in immersion in, in Torah, 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 Gemara, Gemara, Gemara. Thirdly, I think another dynamic was the angry reaction of the Frum to the attacks on Orthodox Judaism in the late 1860s by the left-wing Moschilim, especially Moshe Leib Lilienbull. Let's go to the next one. And uh, Hilary Gordon, I discussed this in the past, where they said, you know, the Shulchan Aruch is wrong, and this is wrong, and Judaism has to be... Um, 
reimagined, uh, you know, cause it mutatis mutandis as they say, but it's perceived as something that wants to destroy the status quo. And so the result is we're going to counter this by making yeshiva and totally excluding the askala from its walls and creating an alternative to that. And finally, I would point to the fact that emerged that you have this new what you call Muslim movement in which they have these very interesting ideas associated with these whole intellectuals with Yisrael Salanter and his followers. The only place you can implement it is in the yeshiva. It's not something you can do in the broad public. Well, it's late, so even though I could go on to great length, I will just leave with the thought of the 19th century as a time of foreign hostile rule for Jews and Lithuanians, with both groups groping their way towards a modern nationalism for the 20th century, and with the Lithuanian Jews transformed from a monolithic culture to a population occupying all possible points on the Hashkafa perspective, from principled atheism to Lubavitch and Musser. That's a pretty interesting picture, and with that I bid you good night.